after I've been there for a while and, you know, be curious, listen, you know, not don't just, and don't come in with a cookie cutter, like, well, I've done this before. Here's what we should do. You know, you need to, of course, learn about the business, learn the history of what's happened before. Sometimes some teams can be uh, more conservative or more fearful of things. And you have to learn why is that? What, what came from that? And sometimes there's a past story there, something didn't go so well and, and they're kind of, they're kind of are battle scarred a little bit. So, so you have to, as you're saying, Todd, you have to build that trust. Welcome back to our series on Chief Community Officers. I'm Todd Nielsen with Clock Tower Advisors. And in this series, we're exploring what it is uh, to be a head of community or chief community officer, that career path from community management or being a community moderator, professional, um, into progressively more strategic and leadership facing kinds of roles. And uh, we've had a variety of guests on so far, and I'm welcoming and very pleased to have back my co-host, Jay Washington from Birdie in the Hand. Jay, thank you for joining. Great to see you. Uh, and Brian Kling, a, uh, a friend who uh, who I met through Fractionals United uh, community, and uh, we're, we're both on the, uh, the community uh, channel on on that particular uh, online community. And uh, as we were talking about his background as the head of community and digital support at the ST Microelectronics, uh, he seemed like he'd be a great guest uh, to bring on. And uh, Brian, you're you're coming to us from Germany, are you not? Actually, Switzerland. I'm in the oh. French part of <laughs> I've been here uh, 18 years now, actually. Oh, wow. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, what, welcome. We're just going to jump right in here uh, in, into the questions. Tell us a little bit about uh, the role that you had um, with, uh, with with ST Microelectronics and the, and how you came into that head of community role. Because it, it looked like you maybe held a couple of different related sorts of positions within, within that organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with ST, I mean, even the beginning, you know, how I got to ST was I was um, on the market and... Normally, then I go to local events and things and try to put myself out there. And it was kind of uncanny. So I was at this Women in Digital Switzerland event. And the woman who ended up becoming my my manager was from ST Microelectronics talking about this new community that they launched. And she said like three or four times in the presentation, oh, if you know someone who could take this to the next level, uh, please let me know. <laughs> so I talked to her right afterwards. And um, I think it was two months later, I started working uh, for ST. So ST is a, a global semiconductor company. Um, their world headquarters is outside of Geneva. Um, so yeah, so then I, I took that role on. And you know what what can happen, I think, even at that level, the head of community, um, I was a sole, an independent um, uh, employee for two years and then started to build a team after that. So even at that level, when they want someone senior who's had a really decent amount of experience. Still, there can be times where you end up, you know, as an independent or an individual contributor, and then you build the team later. So, um, Jay, this seems like something that we've run into with uh, with with community leadership before. Like somebody's brought in as a as a senior community professional, and they're the solo act uh, to begin with until more can be built out. Uh, it seems to be a perennial problem in our space. I know that feeling well, but this isn't my show. It's yours, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. Um, yeah, e even my latest role that I that I was at for Align Technology, I was again brought in as a, a senior season level expert. There, though, it was something different where I was um, building community from nothing, which is something that I had not done before. So that was also interesting. But yeah, I know we're focused on ST today, so could definitely talk more about that. Well, I, I mean, I think we can range uh, across, you know, various roles you've held because this is about your journey uh, to a large extent. You know, I think understanding, um, you know, that that role of head of community, uh, as we've had some other uh, interviews in this series, uh, we've learned in a lot of cases um, that people have moved into that chief community officer or that head of community role as a result of trust they've built in the organization yeah. and that they were brought in and were able to really kind of carve out their own path mm -hmm. or niche into that into that leadership role. 
it sounds like with 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 ST though that uh, they had a need and they identified you and, and brought you in uh, for that role. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit and sort of the dynamic that you walked into in in that or to yeah. the extent that you are comfortable talking about it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So some of the some of the challenges were um, well, they had just migrated from SharePoint, so they had a community on SharePoint. They just migrated to Jive, and this was in the interesting year where um, Jive kind of went through several transformations. So we moved on to Jive. I, I knew the uh, the Lithium Coros platform very well from prior experience. And Jive, what I was heard about was quite good. So I'm like, okay, this would be interesting. I can dig into Jive and learn more about it. Um, but then, as you know, in the course of what was this, 2018, I think it was somewhere around that time frame when Jive got bought twice. Um, so it was, yeah. yes, <laughs> went off the Jive X and the Jive N, I think it was called. Um, and then we had Coros that eventually bought it uh, to Jive X. Yeah. So um, as a as a customer going through that, it was quite a disruptive period, as you can imagine. Um, so kind of that took a lot of my time at that early part navigating those waters, just kind of with you know talk about platform migration, where should we go, who sh you know what should we do, this type of thing. Um, so that was a lot of occupied a lot of time in the beginning. But well, one thing I'll say is for me. Um, when I join an organization, I quickly start to see after I've been there for a while and, you know, be curious, listen, you know, not don't just and don't come in with a cookie cutter like, well, I've done this before. Here's what we should do. You know, you need to, of course, learn about the business, learn the history of what's happened before. Sometimes some teams can be uh, more conservative or more fearful of things. And you have to learn why is that? What what came from that? And sometimes there's a past story there something didn't go so well and, and they're kind of they're kind of are battle scarred a little bit so so you have to as you're saying todd you have to build that trust um and provide examples as well of you know where this has worked really well so um what i've done with any organization i've been in is after i get this kind of feel for the organization i'm really a connector so you know i'm practicing community myself at heart which is how can community connect to other parts of the business where are the opportunities where we can you know, find uh, synergies with what are the goals of some of the other organizations, how can a community meet some of those goals, and then how can we work together, and so it embeds community into the business itself, and so this is something that I'm always keen to do, and reach out, I proactively reach out and build connections around the, around the globe with colleagues and things like that. So. I'm curious, Brian, as you talk about cross-functional partnership, articulating the value of community, and how it can assist cross-functionally with organizational goals. Have you ever met with resistance and how did you overcome that resistance? I often find that there's a lack of understanding of mm -hmm. community and how it can assist, but what has been your experience? Well, I mean, in the, I mean the, the classic traditional one, which is customer service and support, that's kind of a slam dunk, I think, that's pretty solid in most organizations. Sometimes what you can run into there, though, even is when you start to talk about a scalable digital support model, I'm always I'm always quick to talk about how you need both. You need the one to one model and the one to many model in order for a company to to work successfully with their customers. You need that one to one. But sometimes if you have a customer service organization which is not familiar with community, they can see it as a threat and sometimes feel like, wow, you're going to, you know, cut my team in half. You know, I don't want this, you know, we can do something else or, you know, you do your thing, I do mine kind of thing. So that can be a challenge, but I think um, part of it is to talk about how you can reskill some of the existing staff. For example, like if you have a public knowledge base, a lot of times it can be, you can build a whole content strategy and a knowledge strategy, which can be much more robust than a lot of companies currently offer. So in that way, you can work with those subject matter experts and the support team, which are perfect for those type of knowledge articles, this type of thing, training them um, in writing in a more friendly voice for customers, this type of thing, uh, and building out those kind of virtuous flywheels, you know, the content strategy, you know, where you, anal you publish content, you analyze it and then you review it and then you you know publish more or edit content you have or a bit some of your content yeah for example um other challenges um you know in the last company i worked at there was one one group that was very risk averse so that was a medical device company so it was a group that was very risk averse 
And that was a challenge for me personally, um, because I, I've had a long experience doing this, you know, 15 years. So that that one, I guess I'd be, it's kind of like, I, I could have done better. Um, I think the, the, the thing to do there would be to meet with that group individually, um, maybe as a team or even with the individuals and really have an open conversation. Look, I, I feel there's some resistance here. Tell me more about that. Um, where does that come from? Um, I, I acknowledge, you know, part of it, I think, is is also when you find that resistance not to get defensive and like then you start to it does. It's not a good relationship. So part of it is acknowledging for yourself and for the other person. We're both trying to do good things for the company and I'm, nobody's questioning that. So let's understand where we have our differences here. Um, what are the the reasons for um, why you feel uh, so risk averse to the, some of the ideas that I'm proposing? And let's talk it through a little bit and see where we can maybe be halfway. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Have you have you typically seen those kinds of resistances come out at the department departmental level or sort of middle management level, or has that been on the leadership team side of things? Great question. So we're, well, in this particular case, it was on leadership level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as as head of community, um, what was your reporting structure like? Who did you report into, and then who ultimately did you have on your team that that you were able to build out? So, um, in the last number of of places I've worked, I'm using the marketing department. So that's mm -hmm. been pretty common. Um, so at ST, yeah, I was I was reporting into um, in, in ST. They have kind of a different structure where the word uh, head of is at, is at a high level, but for them, director is a higher level and has to have very specific criteria to meet it. So it's kind of interesting sure. because yes, my responsibility was globally for the digital support and for the community, but yet it's just you know it's nomenclature sometimes with a company, right? So. Um, <laughs> So uh, we had a, our VP of, of the marketing, and then there was a person that reported. It was kind of like their digital side of the marketing, and then I reported to them who reported the VP. Um, I was able to add a, a former colleague that I used to work with who I really enjoyed working with, um, who was, so we had um, one person in charge of content and programs, and then the other person was in charge of um, community management and engagement. So. Mm -hmm. And then, did did you have uh, did you have control of a dedicated budget um, for the for the community program overall? I did I did not. No, it was more proposing the things that I wanted to do and then getting that budget. So yeah, this is something that I would like I like to have and I would have liked to have, but yeah, it wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't in that. Level. So you you were you were placed into an influencer role uh, to make recommendations about uh, about approaches, but did you know didn't have the direct uh, fiscal uh, line line of line of responsibility, and I think that's something that happens in a lot of organizations where you know, communities kind of uh, got got to go uh, singing for their supper uh, to 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 get the, the the kinds of expenditures that they that they know are necessary. Mm -hmm. Did did you feel like you had a good um, uh, a, a good person in your corner and that, that VP yeah. of marketing or was it, or was it a tough sell, you know, in, into that? Yeah. Um, I'd say, um, yeah, you can always find your champions within your own group as well as outside the group. And I think that's important. Um, not just at a, at a senior level, but you know, anyone I'd recommend, you know, look for others who are, you know, if we talk about trying to innovate in a company, trying to bring change in a company, uh, the most important thing is to find your champions. So to build this kind of inner group of people that kind of are on the same path and then you can nurture each other, meet together, support each other, this type of thing. And that can help with uh, with innovation and growth. So it also helps with launching new programs and, and uh, services. So like at Autodesk years ago, we launched ideation on the platform. And it was key that I found one of the product managers who was super excited about ideation for their product and wanted to be really involved. And so I worked with him, we launched, and then he told all his peers, and then they started coming to me saying, oh, we want to have ideation for our product as well. So again, mm -hmm. that's, I think anytime you're trying to enact change in an organization, sometimes you'll see from your experience, people will focus on the technology. Um, and I always say the technology is less than half of the battle. So you can, you can create you know, totally. features and functions and processes and all that, but it's it's about 
changing habits, changing mindset and behaviors. And so you have to think about that from the very beginning, um, how you're going to constantly over communicate, um, influence and, and win people over um, to make those changes. I'm going to give you an eclat because that is so true. So <laughs> true. I really appreciate that. As I'm listening to you, you've clearly had a lot of experience through your journey, navigating some of the challenges as a community mm -hmm. leader. If you could share, because we'll have people from all levels of experience in community work listening to this podcast, what's one of your pieces of shared wisdom or pieces of wisdom gained throughout this journey as a community leader that you can share with some of those individuals who aspire to be a community executive, to, to reach the community, uh, the level of executive in the community space? Well, here's, here's something that might be a little um, unusual to say, but it's something I've always remembered and stuck with. So there was one VP when I was at Autodesk, and he told me once, he said, sometimes, Brian, you have to let a problem be a problem. So what that means is a lot of times we as community professionals, we want to solve everything. So we want to identify the problems and we want to solve them. And a lot of times we take on more than our scope, which is fine up to a certain point. But if you solve too many problems that are real problems and you, you're not really solving them, but you're just putting a lot of extra energy into them that beyond the scope of your job, um, then the problem isn't really fixed, right? So sometimes you, you need to not jump in and say, oh, I can fix that or I can do that. Um, again, I don't wanna say don't, you know, don't take on extra responsibilities and things, but be mindful of where you put your energy and you know, don't try to solve everything for everybody. Sometimes, because you know, you have to sit back for a minute and think, what is that problem? I can maybe do it for a while, but I'm actually solving the root of the problem. Um, you're actually doing a disservice if you kind of jump in and put a bandaid on it for the organization. You know, it's okay in a short term, but if it if you're doing it and it turns out they rely on you for that, and two years later you're like, oh, why am I still doing this thing? When right. it's really an issue, they should solve that problem as a business. Um, not just have somebody who's a well-wisher come in and do their best job at it and just kind of put a Band-Aid on top of it. So that would be something I'm going to mention. That, that is such a <laughs> wonderful wisdom bomb. I mean, yes. like the, the, it, it's a sign, I think, of, of executive maturity. They're recognizing, like, you, you, you only have so much energy to give around, you know, to things. And, you know, by, by putting energy after something that isn't within the scope of, of, of your problems, and and that that only leads to resentment over time and and frustration and on your part and 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 it doesn't allow that problem that, to then be seen and surfaced in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. I think that so many people in the community space are altruistic to a fault uh, with, within the, within the space, and it it's damaging. And and then like as we've seen like with so many people in the community professional space in 2023 and into 2024 here who found themselves with without work i think they've ended up leaving organizations where they were carrying more of that burden than they should have mm -hmm. and it's it's probably just coming out now for some of those organizations that that lost good people that were probably dying on the wrong hill mm -hmm. uh that that that, that it's it's going to hurt those organizations in in the long term that that those things weren't allowed to be problems in some cases. Yeah. I think you know community work is collective work, and so if you take on too much under the mindset that you alone will work to solve or resolve or you know it it, it removes this whole idea of it takes a village, and so mm -hmm. creating an environment where and I love the term mindfully or mindful, Brian, because I think that is also, for me, a very key component of doing community work. It's about being present and mindful and aware. Mm -hmm. And so can you share a little bit about that process or process around that, that mindfulness element? Is that something that you lean into or a, a strategy yes. that you include? Well, I mean, my wife is a yoga and meditation instructor, so I have to give her kudos for that. <laughs> nice. Um, and I have I have 
um, meditated and I've attended retreats and things like that. So, you know, mindfulness meditation, you know, for anyone who's, who's looked into it, it's not, you know, I, I think most people understand now it's not really a religion. So it's more about a, a practice. And so what mindfulness allows you to do is uh, if your mind is running all the time and you can just kind of go on autopilot. And so you're just being reactive to everything around you. So mindfulness allows you to step back, step behind that, and then take a breath, take a pause. Okay, what is that thing I'm all worked up about? What kind of priority does it have for me? Is it serving me or not? Does it bring me energy? Does it suck energy? Um, is it something I should be doing or somebody else? These type of things. So it gives you this way to, to reflect on where you're putting your energy and, and your time and, and try to be more conscious of that, which I think as a leader, you must have if you're going to be effective. You know, you need to be strategic with your time, that your time is the most valuable resource, really. So you are talking my language. Uh, yeah. You snaps and a clap. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, if, if you were going to put together a, a a primer or a how-to book for a chief executive officer in an organization uh, that, that, that explains what they would need to work effectively with community, like what, what, what advice would you give them if it was just a, maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a manual, maybe it's a heart to heart. If you're going to sit down to them uh, over, over a drink and just say, Look, you know, this is your company. This is the kind of organization you have. You want to you want a community because, and this is how you can work effectively with a community leader that, that you would bring in. What what kind of advice would you give them? Well, I think um, I might start with a high level conversation around, you know, for those companies that already have a community or a successful one. I would ask them the question of who in their company spends the most time with customers every day. Now, the sales team spends a lot of time, but in companies with a large community that's been around for a while, I would argue that it's the folks working in the community that actually see more interactions and actually interact with more customers a day, even than the sales team. So to me, it's I'm, I'm always hyper you know, customer focused in the things that I do. And it's sort of like in order for the business to really stay um, on track with the market and to fit the market needs, you constantly need to be taking these signals from your customers to make sure that your products, your services, and your programs are matching what they need and are anticipating what's coming up. And so sales, perfect example there, they're meeting with customers and that live interaction in the office, you get more context even than you can, of course, digitally. Uh, but a, a community team can also get a real strong finger on the pulse of what's happening and then you tie this into other things like, you know, web analytics and content strategy, where I ask some main questions like, you know, what are customers looking for? Um, does it solve their problem? How difficult is it for them to achieve uh, these type of things? So all of these things can give you a real good, I mean, my, I'm also certified in CX. So CX is very important to me. This, this whole experience of the customer with the company and how to make bring that to the fore. And I think any any company that doesn't have any type of community experience is really, it's like walking with one leg, frankly. I mean, it's because it's a different way to interact too, because it's not just company to customer, it's customer to customer. And they're gonna have conversations and you're gonna learn a lot about that. You know, what we always say in community too, is that um, you need a community because your product team or the team that creates your services, et cetera, you anticipate what customers need you have customer focus groups, you have all these things, then that's great, perfect. But you can't anticipate every way that a customer is going to use your product or service. But by these seeing these conversations between customers and how they're using things, that gives you another layer of insights, which which can help guide you know, your strategy going forward and, and discoveries as well. Yeah. Yeah, that that's really that's really brilliant, uh, Brian. Thank we you. recently heard from one of our community leaders, OGs, if you will, that executive level community roles aren't or won't evolve as a thing, as a thing. And I'm curious your thoughts around that as someone who has sat solidly in the community leader space uh, on a ST level, what are your thoughts or SL level? What are your thoughts around the evolution of community and roles 
uh, as executive roles within the, the space? Well, I have to say from my experience, what I would say is um, there are many C-suite um, uh, folks who don't understand CX. They don't understand community. Um, you know, they they understand where they come came from, which, okay, we're all like that, right? But what I see as the opportunity is, again, this, this extreme customer focus. Um, you know, it's like a, a community. A, CX, you know, is a is a buzzword, right? So yeah. some companies say, yeah, you know, we're all in on CX. And for our CX day, what we tell everybody is, yeah, you got to talk to the customer more. But there's so much more <laughs> to CX than just, you know, talking to and listening to customers. That's an important part. But there's a, there's a whole gamut of strategies and processes and programs around that to really make sure that you're hearing the voice of the customer. It's not just what they say, it's how they act. It's, um, you know, even web analytics, even quantitative analytics can give you behavioral trends and things, um, mm -hmm. you know. So it's it's really, we can talk about extreme customer focus, but how many companies are willing to actually go there? But the, the benefits are huge, you know, if you look at some of the, the companies that practice it in a, in a strong way. Um, but there are many companies that just still are, are behind that curve. And, uh, you know, I... I, I, you know, if I'm really to be tongue in cheek about it, um, I've often felt like if I could talk to the C-suite, you know, I don't have, I didn't have worked out solid numbers and like a whole metrics, but I often feel like if we would focus on some of these macro items, I think the company could be up to 20% more profitable, 15 to 20%. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's my intuition. And it's interesting to hear you say uh, that that CX and community are misunderstood uh, by by, by C-suites to a, to a large extent. Um, I, I had had some recent conversations with a chief revenue officer uh, who had uh, told me in no uncertain terms, and I've been turning this around in my head because I don't think she's wrong, but uh, that 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 although she had been in organizations where there were effective communities and. Um, and that they were supported, you know, spaces. Uh, she felt that of all the CEOs that she worked with, many of them viewed community as a tactical solution. They didn't really see it as a strategic partner. And uh, and this came up on the very same webinar that uh, Jay was just referring to with one of one of the, the leading voices in our in the community space. Uh, you know, just kind of saying that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be using community as a word anymore in a description of what it is that we do. Is it a, is it a nomenclature problem that as soon as we start talking about community, um, the you know, if we were in, in cartoon land, the, 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 the thought bubble above the, the mm -hmm. CEO's head would be this little gnarled tangle of, of you know, of squiggles. Like uh, it's this abstract thing. I don't fully, you know, wrap my head around it, or I don't see what the value is, or how how that works. Is there a way we should be talking about it? I guess uh, is what I what I end up struggling with a little bit. Great question. Yeah, I, I mean, I I always come back to the you know human centered design, you know, because I I study design thinking as well. So human centered design and extreme customer focus. I always say those are in my DNA. So. You know, I'm more, I, I do more than just community. I do more than just CX. It's really about going outside the box of how can we build. I mean, I guess what I would challenge any C-suite person with is what's, what's more valuable than making sure you have efficient um, automated processes going on or beneficial cycles going on where you're constantly getting feedback from your customers. How am I doing? Am I fitting the market needs? What's more important than that? And again, as we talked about earlier, sales, I mean, of course you need sales to do that. I think a lot of times that could even be improved. Like they're super busy, you know, the sales reps are out there. They got so many things to do and they're running around and stuff. So they may not always give all the feedback and the insights to every customer visit into the system. But there needs to be some way to collect and bring in and suss out all of these trends that are coming in. And this is where, you know, with AI coming out now, I mean, that's one of the benefits of AI, right, is that it, and with technology like that is it can suss out from large data sets what those trends are that are coming. So, you know, I think that can be a, a benefit going forward. But I mean, I, I challenge any company, you know, 
don't you want to hear from your customers? Don't you want to see what they're doing? And yet, and there's always that classic example of like Steve Jobs. They say like, you know, we never would have done the 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 iPod um, because people would have said like Henry Ford. They would have said, I want a better horse. They didn't know about a car. Mm -hmm. And I think I've come up with at least for me an answer for that kind of line of thinking, which is if you want to innovate in something that's never been done before, I agree with them because people can't conceive of something they've never experienced. Mm -hmm. But if you want to improve something you already have, that's where you must have this feedback if you really want to make sure that you're going to be successful in what's happening. So. I, I love that. And the, uh, the, the, the mechanism that, uh, that organizations have in place by building a community where there are, where there are those customers talking to each other, where you get the benefit of having that 24, 7, 365 uh, feedback loop uh, or, or the, you know, the, 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 the focus group that never ends, as I sometimes, you know, talk, talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, like what organization wouldn't want that? Why wouldn't they have something like that in place? And if you think about sort of the cost of ownership for something like that, it's low when it comes down to it. Um, yeah, it think scales about, really well. Well, I really appreciate that in community spaces, you know, for me, it's first about safe spaces that mm -hmm. allow you to be honest. So oftentimes I think customers experience or clients experience this transactional relationship with an, a company mm -hmm. or an organization. For me, I'm very intentional about this idea of safe spaces that allow mm -hmm. you to provide real constructive feedback. And obviously there's rules of engagement we're not just going to shame, blame, or guilt anyone in these spaces, but the idea is a less formal way to engage and provide ideation and feedback that can directly impact future offerings. And so, yeah. you know, when you talk about community and its value within the infrastructure of an organization, I think so inside is outside. If you've not created safe spaces internally to talk about some of the challenges and problems within a process or an organization or a product, then you can't really extend that broadly in a way that resonates. How, what do you do intentionally to create space that yep. offers access to the gold that is ideation and feedback from company customers? Okay, well I, well, I think, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's very simple. It boils down to really authenticity and transparency. Yes. So, I mean, if people know that you're not trying to use them for something, yes. but yeah. you're trying to have a dialogue and you're trying to also enable them to sh express and share what they want to say, um, that creates a much better relationship. And then, you know, we can get into, you know, community, um, you know, the, the, the uh, principles for the community, you know, when you have the, the, the rules and, and why am I forgetting the, the name of the typical, uh, the of yeah. all that kind of stuff, guidelines, yeah. yeah. So this is why that's so critical because you're setting up what are, how do we want to interact with each other? When you join this community, you are accepting this code that we have agreed on with each other and people that fall outside that code are going to have to be, you know, taken care of. Um, so, you know, that that's just how you need to do it. And, you know, we if you look at even high-performing teams, Google studied this for many years and I remember reading with interest, you know, the most high performing teams were the ones where one could be themselves. They could yes. vent yes. and give feedback and this type of thing. So they feel like it's a safe space where they know that they can uh, share and be themselves. And I think that translates to, to everything. So Brian, Brian, get out of my head. Cause I was I just going to bring up that Google, that Google study <laughs> and research about like psychological safety was like one yeah. of the key factors for the productivity of teams. Um, right. And, and, and I think like for any organization that says they care about what their customers say about mm -hmm. them, if they're really going to going to walk that talk and, and have a community out there, they, they, they need to make sure that that community is not taking down opinions that they don't particularly like right. themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, do you really want to hear the truth about how people feel about your product or service? Um, not, not people that are being abusive, but people that are, they care enough about your product that they're actually telling you what's what's wrong with it or why it's not working for them. I mean, that's that's money in your pocket um, yeah. that's happening. And and so organizations that that, that will create a community and, and yet are too thin skinned to accept any criticisms of, of what mm -hmm. it is or, or, or what the, or, or 
or what that you know what they could be um that that that's a that's a, an immediate failure you know in in my book and yeah uh, and it's it's a fear that a lot of companies still have that i heard back when i started this and you know when social media first came out but what if somebody says something bad about our company in public and it's like well yeah that's gonna i mean it's like when you're at a party happen. or you're out in somewhere you're going to hear all kinds of opinions but as we all know now after many years of practice it's about how you deal with that situation it's not about if it's going to happen it will happen but you can yeah. sometimes turn the biggest detractor into your biggest advocate by how you handle the situation so you know it's again it's about being transparent and authentic and being human okay yeah. brian on the on the wave of being vulnerable and transparent share one mistake that you've learned from in your career as a community leader has there been a mistake or a lesson learned from an experience that you can share with others that they may also learn and grow from let's see um what i <laughs> come on oh, this, be a good <laughs> this is a safe space <laughs> this is a safe space <laughs> um, uh we can omit names and spaces to yeah. protect the innocent <laughs> I think, I think one thing i would just put out there is as a, as a high warning is um if you are going to do a community uh, implementation program with a vendor and there are multiple third-party vendors to use um uh make use the competitive bids if one bid is one third the cost of all the other ones don't use that bid. I, I was kind of pushed into doing that, and it was a big, uh, it was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how did that change you as a leader? Like moving forward, learning from that experience, did, was it to trust your voice and your judgment? How did that impact how you move forward as as a leader? Well, I think it's to first reflect on you know maybe how I could have communicated better. Cause I think in, in anything that happens, it's never like one's one person's or one side's fault. You know, everyone has to take some accountability. Agreed. So it's where could I have been more open, more firm about my opinion, Okay. Um, you know, this type of thing. And, and now I can tell the story of an example of, well, when this happened in the past, here's the results we got this type of thing. So it's, it's about, um, you know, I really like learning from every experience. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and like I said, in in the other challenge I had with one with one group who was very um, uh, reticent to do some of the things that I wanted to do, which are common community practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could just get mad at them and say, well, why don't you, you know, believe me or trust me? But it's also like, well, what am I doing wrong mm. that we aren't open enough to have this conversation where, you know, somehow we can be more open and meet each other halfway. So how can I, how can I open that door? Um, so again, not taking things personally, but just kind yeah. of acknowledging as we, as I said before, you know, we're all, we're all trying to do great work here. So another person should not feel like, oh, you think you're so great. And, you know, like I'm not good or whatever, but it's, you need to acknowledge it. Most people, I think I, maybe I'm Pollyanna, but I think most people are trying to do a great job. They're, they want to do a really good job. They care about customers. It doesn't always match maybe in some of the opinions of how we do that, but um, we need to acknowledge that with each other so that then we have a more healthy conversation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Brian, I, I feel like we're, we're coming all too quickly to the, to the end of our conversation here, uh, but uh, I wanted to, to thank you. Uh, in, in the most heartfelt way, you know, for for sharing uh, of yourself and and your experiences uh, in in the, the the leadership role in which you you've held and leadership roles you continue to hold, mm -hmm. um, I I, I want to say like every one of these interviews that that, that we do uh, some some new interesting ideas and approaches come on. This this has been no exception um, to that. Um, we, we appreciate your. Your ideas and your wisdom you know that you shared here today um and and for those of you who are watching uh if you're a community professional if you or if you've held a leadership uh role as a community professional how have have brian's experiences uh met with your own uh what what kinds of challenges did you see what kinds of things did you run into with your leadership teams uh to get to get buy-in 
what mistakes did you make? Um, we'd love to hear about that. And hey, uh, CEOs and C-suite and CMOs uh, who have been working with community professionals, what could you be doing better uh, to understand how community fits into the mix of customer engagement and customer success and customer experience and loyalty? Um, these things that are uh, critical to every organization, um, how can you partner better with this element of the organization that is so key uh, to your success going forward. We'd love to hear from you on this. We're going to have more uh, interviews in this series, and uh, we'll hope you follow along with us. Um, I, I know that Jane and I will be checking for everybody's comments, and uh, we, we will jump in uh, on, on everybody. Uh, that any Anyone who wants to start a dialogue about this, we're, we're eager to do it, because we think that there is a, there is a future uh, for this role. And that there is a career path, uh, in, indeed, and and so I hope you'll uh, you'll join us next time. And if you uh, came across this and you know of a uh, a leader that needs to see this, you know, please forward it to them. And we ask that you subscribe and uh, and, and comment uh, on your own as well. Until then, keep building great communities, and we'll see you in the next installment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.